Hello and welcome to the Q&A show. If you're watching us in the evening, it's just gone 10 o'clock at night. That means that we're live and we're very much looking forward to interacting. That means chatting, talking with you. And I'm delighted to say that my special guest for this evening's Q&A is none other than Pastor Derek Walker, the senior pastor of the Oxford Bible Church. So Derek, good evening and welcome to the programme. Good evening, Gordon. Great to be with you. Well, we're working you hard tonight. You've just come off Bible <laughs> study and uh, yeah. Book of Jonah, and we're very much looking forward to talking uh, with you this evening. And, and because Derek's here, it means that uh, we're looking forward very much to getting lots of questions from you. If you've got questions that you want to ask, particularly to do with the, the scriptures, then please do send them to live at revelationtv.com or to the text number that you can see there on the screen. They come through to me straight in the studio. I get them on my iPad and I'm going to be reading as many of them out as I can do this evening and hearing from the learned uh, scholar that we have with us in uh, Derek Walker tonight. So I'm sure you've got lots of questions you'd like to ask about from the Bible, then this is your opportunity to do so. But just while you're, you're, you're getting your, your thoughts together and you're writing your email, let, let me start. And, and I want to start by, by making a confession, really, because um, pulling rank is not a Christian virtue, but sometimes it's quite useful. And it was quite a few weeks ago now that um, Derek was on a programme with Howard Conda and they were talking and somebody had written in and they particularly wanted to ask Derek a question on Ezekiel 38 and 39. And Derek, in his normal way, began to expound and to talk about it. And when he'd finished, he said to the viewer, if you want to know more, then you could always get hold of my book. And uh, he held his book up and it was called The Imminent Invasion of Israel. And uh, he said all the things that we've been talking about this evening are in it. Well, that's where I was able to pull rank because I rang up the control room and I said to the control room, will you ask Derek when he finishes the programme to leave that book that he's just held up? And I'm delighted to say that the next morning on my desk was that very book. So it uh, works some time. But I've enjoyed reading it and there are lots of, of good things in it. But there's one point where I have to say, Derek, I I'm not sure. And I thought a good point to start tonight would be to ask you about it. Because at one point in your book, in, at page 151, you talk, uh, well, you, you look at Ezekiel 83, 13, is it 13? Yeah, 13. Uh, Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish and all the young lions will say to you, have you come <coughs> to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take livestock and goods, to take great plunder? And in your book, you suggest that that country, referring to Tarshish, might in fact be Great Britain or uh, Spain. Derek, just for a minute or two this evening as we start the programme, can you just explain for simpletons like me a bit more of how you get to that point? Yes. Um, in fact, if you re read a lot of books, they kind of assume that it's Spain because it's in the Western Mediterranean. Um, for instance, Jonah, when he wanted to get away from the presence of, of the Lord as far as possible, which of course was, you know, primarily located in the temple in Jerusalem, he got in the ship uh, in Joppa. And now that's, of course, on, on, the, on the western coast there. And the idea of Tarshish is that it was far away as possible, um, you know, fr fr from Israel, for example. Now, that means it has to be, you know, well, that's why they suggest Spain. But, of course, the United Kingdom... Uh, as we call it now, is actually uh, more inaccessible from, for, you know, from Israel. And that was the furthest known place known at that time. In, in fact, only really the Phoenician traders who were famous, um, you know, could, could actually went, went to the United Kingdom. The reason is, and of course, at the time of Ezekiel's writing, um, sorry, uh, the, the reason is, because of the bronze, you know, in the Bronze Age, the key metal is bronze. And so you need tin plus copper. 
And now the copper can you can get from many places, but tin was very rare. And really, the British Isles were one of the few places where you could get the tin. And so it was very precious metal. And and so they actually had to build special ships to reach Tarshish. It's not it doesn't really fit with just, you know, uh, the Western Mediterranean, you needed ocean go, go, going liners called ships of Tarshish, which were that, that could handle the open ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, in order to get there. And we know for many years the Phoenicians kept the secret of how to get to Tarshish. But, um, but the fact that, um, you know, Tarshish traded in tin, there's a key verse, I think, in Ezekiel. Um, 20 uh let me try and find it um that talks about that they traded in tin now that that actually points to the united kingdom we used to be called the tin islands you know and until mm -hmm. quite recently actually um it was tin was was being being mined in in wales and in cornwall ezekiel 27 12 says tarshish was your merchant and this is speaking to Tyre, who were the Phoenicians, because of your many luxury goods, they gave you silver, iron, tin, and lead from your goods. All of those things were uh, metals from from the British Isles, particularly tin. So that that's one of the lines of reasoning to say that Tarshish is, is not Spain, but it is Britain, um, because it has to be to the west because of Jonah. Uh, the other line of reasoning is that it appears in this end time prophecy, a prophecy that hasn't been fulfilled yet, Ezekiel 38. And of course, you know, we know that Spain, um, you know, is not a great power. And so there, it doesn't really make sense in the end time concept that that the that it talks about Tarshish and her young lions, which which speaks of a nation that had a number of of colonies. Well, of course, Spain d does have did have these colonies in South America, but really it wouldn't really be very relevant if we talked about the, the Spanish um, colonies objecting to this in, invasion. It, it, that would be kind of like, that just doesn't fit the present situation. But it does fit very much the Tarshish nations. If Tarshish is the United Kingdom, then we're talking about the United States. We're talking about the Commonwealth countries. In fact, we're talking about the allied powers who God has already used twice in the end times to resist the, the force of evil that come out of continental Europe, you know, in the two world wars. And so ta the Tarshish nations have already played a key role in the end times already. And here it, it indicates that the, that the Tarshish nations, you know, God gives them a mention for some reason. And, and that's... You know, I believe that that is a, a good mention that that we get there. So I would say weighing the evidence, um, the best evidence does point to the United Kingdom being Tarshish. Amazing, Derek. Do you know, I, I, I've been in the Christian church a long time, but I've never actually heard anyone expound that before. So thank you so much. And I imagine that quite a number of people will be, be getting out their Bible concordances and looking up Tarshish and beginning to study and to uh, see for themselves uh, what the scriptures have to say. Thank you so it, much, it, at least for... It, 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 you know, sorry, Gordon, it, yeah? it's not just a curiosity as well. It actually has implications for us as a nation because there are prophecies concerning Tarshish. For instance, that Tarshish will be a blessed nation in the millennium. Right. And as a result, that is an encouragement that God will revive this nation again because of, you know, generally, Tarshish is mentioned in a positive way in the end time. So I, that gives me encouragement that the, the, the call and the destiny on this nation, although we failed God in many ways, God hasn't finished with us and God still has a purpose for this nation. Amen. Well, we pray that it will be the case. And thank you so much for sharing it, Derek. Well, lots of emails and texts have certainly come in. So let's see if we can get through some of them. And I start with one from Dave. In fact, he says two questions. In Jeremiah 13, 23, in the King James Version, it says, a leopard cannot change its spots. And he says, supposing someone, for instance, like Yemi, was a Muslim, 
and is now a Christian, is that not a leper changing its spots? And then in Genesis 7 verse 1, it says Noah was righteous, Job 2, 3, Job was righteous. And then in Romans 3, 10 and 3, 23, it says no one was righteous. It says, which is right, says Dave. What was the leopard scripture again? Uh, leopard scripture, Jeremiah 13, 23. In the, he says King James. So, um, Jeremiah, what did I just read out? Jeremiah yeah. thirteen twenty three. Yes. So I would say for for that one, that is talking, and I think the context bears it out that it, it's talking about the the human heart, that in ourselves we cannot change ourselves. We cannot make ourselves good. You know, mm. if it wasn't for the grace of God, and, and I'm sure Yemi would agree that if if it wasn't for the grace of God, you know, he would never, you know, have found the salvation. So it's saying that in ourselves, apart from God, we cannot change. But praise God, we can change, you know, but by the grace of God. But we don't get the glory. Uh, it, it's God's work in us. And, and so God gets the glory. So obviously people can change, you know, in a very real way, in a heart way. If we couldn't, we, we couldn't be saved. But, uh, but a leopard cannot change its own spots. That's, that, that is the point. We cannot make ourselves good. Mm. Only God can make us good. It's by the grace of God that we are what we are. Uh, I can't forget, I forgot the second question now. <laughs> well, the, the second question was, on a similar line, Genesis 7, 1, Noah was righteous, Job 2, 3, jo Job was righteous. And then in Romans 3, 10 and 3, 23, it says no one was righteous, which is right. It, it's similar again, because yeah. um, none of us is righteous in ourselves. However, there are people called righteous in the Bible because they're believers. They're justified by faith. So, for instance, Abraham's the classic example. It says that Abraham believed God. Actually, he believed in the Messiah, the promise of the Messiah. And it said it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Uh, and so they are righteous through their faith in Christ. And, of course, by may, being made right with God, that, 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 that no doubt was expressed in the fact that they, they did live morally good lives. But um, it's, they were righteous through their faith. They didn't have a kind of inherent righteousness themselves that God said, oh, well, he's righteous, I'm going to save him. Their righteousness ultimately came from God through their faith. None of us can stand before God in our own righteousness. Um, and, and so it's a similar answer, I would say. Okay. There's a saying in the Bible which is, have understanding. And our next question is, what is the definition? What does it mean, the biblical saying, have understanding? Yeah, I, I think that I see the three things together. Knowledge, what we should seek for is knowledge, understanding and wisdom. So knowledge is the facts of the matter. You know, you can read the Bible and you can learn a lot of facts about the Bible. Understanding is understanding how all the facts are related, how everything connects together. You know, rather than just you, lots of ind individual facts, you actually see the underlying principles, the underlying connections that link all those facts together. And then that takes your, your knowledge to a different level. And then on the foundation of knowledge and understanding, wisdom is how to put that into action, how to apply that to your life. So wisdom is practical. Mm -hmm. Wisdom is based on knowledge and understanding. It's, it's, it's putting that into practice so that you live skillfully, so that you live wisely. Okay, thank you. Now, Marion from Chesterfield wants to go to the end of the tribulation. And she says, did Gordon and Derek, at the very end of the tribulation, when Jesus returns to earth, who will live on the earth with him for the thousand years? Good question, yes. We will, as Revelation 19 says, we, we as the church will have been raptured and we're, we will have been in heaven for some time and we return with Christ on those white horses 
and uh, we are part of that king army of God returning to the earth, Jesus will establish his kingdom on the earth. So those who are living um, on the earth are a mixture of believers and unbelievers, you know, mostly unbelievers, but, um, uh, but there will be believers who got saved during the tribulation. So that's one reason why you have to have the rapture before the tribulation, because if the rapture was right at the end of the tribulation, and the post-tribbers just don't have an answer for this, if the rapture happens at the end of the tribulation, then of course all the believers are, are in their resurrection bodies. Mm -hmm. And that means the only people left alive in their natural bodies on the earth are unbelievers, and, and so and there are many scriptures tell us that the unbelievers are not allowed to inherit the, the messianic kingdom on God. So there'll, there'll be no one left. But in fact, what happens is that there is the judgment of the sheep and the goats. And Jesus separates the sheep, the believers, from the goats, which are the unbelievers. And only the sheep are allowed to possess the kingdom. So the only way you can you can harmonize all of that is to understand that the raptures happened already before the tribulation and then there's another great soul harvest in the tribulation we read about that in revelation 7 144,000 go out preaching the gospel and many many multitudes get saved many are martyred of course mm -hmm. but by the end of the tribulation there is a remnant of people who are saved you know it may only be a few million i mean who knows but they will then form the uh, initial population on the earth and they'll have children and in the millennium people will live for a thousand years you know the curse will be lifted from the earth so there'll be a great population explosion again but it will be like the garden of eden again you know the humanity will be cut down to a relatively small size and then like adam and eve they will start to multiply and and fill the earth again so um yeah it, it, it's a good point um, yeah. that it, there, that's one major reason why the rapture has to be before the tribulation. Okay. Well, if Howard was here, I'm sure he'd be wanting to come back to you on that. But bless you. Thank you so much for sharing it. Now, uh, Leslie and Marion Gaston, they visited your church in Oxford um, before the coronavirus struck. Uh, they come from Cheltenham and they plan a return visit once all the restrictions are over. Anyway, they've recently become aware. Excellent. Sorry. Yep, they've recently become aware of preterism. I hope that's the right way to pronounce it, um, which they say is being taught in some Bible believing churches. And they're alarmed at the derogatory comments made towards those of us who hold a futurist viewpoint. We believe, they say, that it's a very dangerous teaching. Would you agree? And in what way would you address this issue in order to debunk preterism? Yes, I mean, I. I agree. Uh, I have no respect for preterism at all. But sadly, you know, even there are evangelicals that support it. First of all, to explain what it is, they would say that all pretty much all the prophecies that we would look at, for instance, as being prophecies of the tribulation and the second coming mm -hmm. of Christ, um, for instance, in the Olivet Discourse and the book of Revelation, they would say all those prophecies have already been fulfilled uh, in AD 70, mm -hmm. which uh, was when the Roman armies, you know, destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. And, and you know, if you've got your head screwed on, sorry, I'm a bit, I feel quite strong here about this. Um, you know, if you've got your head screwed on, you'd be saying, what? What are you talking about? You know, mm -hmm. when it talks about Jesus coming in, in the clouds in power and glory. Well, apparently that was the Roman armies, you know, as the instrument of his judgment. So the bottom line, if you're a preterist, and there's a reason they do that. They, uh, I believe one reason they do that anyway is, um, well, my main issue is that it, it disrespects Bible prophecy. It, it, these are good evangelicals. In every, every, every other area of Bible doctrine, they will say we must interpret the Bible according to the, the grammatical, historical, you know, literal interpretation. But for some reason, in the realm of prophecy, we could throw all the normal rules away and we can just make, sim you know, allegorize it and spiritualize it and make, make it mean what we think we want it to mean. Uh, I think one of the mo motivations is they don't like 
the biblical scenario of the end times where, you know, things are heading towards a, a terrible time ahead, the tribulation. They would prefer to believe, many, not all of them, but many of them would believe, prefer to believe that the church is just going to be victorious and take over the earth and bring in the kingdom of God on the earth. And so um, it allows... It allows you to have a very optimistic view of the future, whereas they would kind of see um, those who believe that we're heading towards the tribulation as, as having a negative view of the future. So that is one motivation for that. But bottom line is they, they, do, they have to spiritualize prophecy in, in, a, in an extreme way. And uh, they really deny that the, the book of Revelation is, is a prophecy for the end times. I'm very much a futurist, which means that many these prophecies that have not been fulfilled literally are going to be fulfilled literally. I mean, after all, so many prophecies concerning Christ's first coming, they were fulfilled literally. Jesus really was born in Bethlehem, etc. And therefore, we should believe that the remaining prophecies will be uh, fulfilled literally. Okay, well, to Leslie and Marianne, Marianne, I hope that helps you to understand um, the answer. And also to those of you who haven't heard the term preterism before, then to watch out for it, how important, important it is that we understand what the scriptures are teaching and that we follow our doctrine. And uh, you talked there about uh, understanding and knowing the times we're living in. Well, Jill has sent a very nice, simple uh, question. Hi, Derek, how close are we? to Jesus' return. There you are. How would you like to answer that, Derek? Well, uh, so close. <laughs> <laughs> close. Um, of course, we understand the scriptures that say, you know, no one knows the day or the hour. And he was talking about his coming, particularly his coming in the rapture, because those in the tribulation will be able to know exactly, you know, the timetable of the tribulation is, is pretty well established from Daniel and Revelation. But for though, but for his coming in the rapture, no one knows. And he says, uh, for your Lord is coming at a, at a time that you do not expect. So um, therefore, we have to just say, Jesus could come at any time. Um, his coming is imminent. But I do believe very much that it's, for instance, in my lifetime, uh, but I, I can't put a number on it, you know, because Jesus wants us to live in the expectancy that he could come at any time. And uh, he has deliberately kept the timing of his coming uh, as a secret. OK, that's good. Now, here's someone who's been listening to your Bible study, Marcus from London E17. He said, you did say in the Jonah Bible study to take the Bible literally. So he wants you to help him understand. He says, blessings, Gordon and Derek. In 1 Kings 20, in the war with Ben Hadad, can you explain the meaning of 1, verse, 1 Kings 20, verse 30? He says, did 27,000 men actually die when a wall collapsed on them? Uh, now, do you want to look it up? 1 Kings 20 and verse 30. Um, but the 30. rest fled to Aphek, into the city. Then a wall fell on 27,000 of the men who were left, is what it says. Yeah, um, well, um, you know, I haven't studied that verse in particular, but that's what uh, that particular translation says. Sometimes with these um, numbers, um, uh, there can be a manuscript variation. I don't know if that's the case in this, in this verse, that... Um, uh, I'm just checking other translations just to make sure that they're all consistent with that. Um, yeah, that's what it says. So uh, that is possible, of course. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to. They were obviously cramped um, into a small space. But uh, no, sometimes, um, I'm not an expert on, on some of these things, but uh, sometimes there, there's a, a certain um, 
you can be read in two ways. And sometimes they say, well, it's not really 27,000, it's 2,700. Mm. But uh, the translations seem to be consistent that it's 27,000. So I'll, I'll have to say, you know, that's, that's what it says. That's that's what happened. Uh, I'd have to study that in more detail just okay, to well, check the original Hebrew on that. All See, right, well, maybe in a future maybe program was, uh, you can come back and uh, you can tell yeah, us what you found yeah. out. I don't know whether you want to comment on the next question or not, Derek, because um, it's from Annie and she's saying, um, referencing God saying in the Bible that he's against those who consider dividing the land of Israel, she wonders if this could have affected the recent US election and the recent Israel elections, and whether you've got a comment that you'd like to make on it. Yeah, I, I... I'm not sure um, that you could say that the Trump some there were some people saying that because Trump had this peace uh, um, this peace plan that involved a division of the land uh, that therefore that you know caused a caused an issue. I I don't know. Um, it seems to me that of all the presidents, he was the most pro-Israel and and that there were probably other reasons why he wasn't re-elected. I don't personally think that that was the decisive one because, you know, generally speaking, if he he was very pro-Israel and his his approach seemed to be blessing Israel rather than cursing Israel. And even though theoretically it could have led to a two-state solution it it the whole thing was geared up to be honest that the that the the palestinians wouldn't have accepted uh, accepted it so the the a two-state solution coming out of that plan that did was not really realistic so i don't think that was the key issue in that in that case in other cases it often is i mean you know when when nations turn against israel you can see throughout history that that can bring about their fall. Um, but in, in the case of the President Trump, I don't think that was the key issue myself. Okay, thanks. Now, Phil is asking a one here. He's, well, let me read out what he says. Hi, Derek. The Bible says in Genesis 5, 3, that Eve didn't give birth to Adam's third child, Seth, until Adam was 130 years old. But God had commanded Adam and Eve in Genesis 1.28 to be fruitful and multiply. And Phil says, isn't this rather a slow rate of progress? And how old do you think Adam was when Cain, Adam and Eve's first child, was born? And would this have been before or after the fall? Uh, the, the, I, the fall happened... Well, I can't prove this. I believe the fall happened fairly quickly. I believe the fall happened 40 days after Adam's creation. And that's because there was a testing time of 40 days. But, and we don't get the impression that they had children or anything like that. It was just Adam and Eve. Um, and that's why the second Adam had to be tested for 40 days. This time he passed the test. So they didn't have any children, or they didn't have time to have children, if you like, before that. Another thought is that, of course, not all their children are mentioned in the Bible. Only the key children that are relevant to the line. It, the Bible is, you know, Genesis particularly is very compressed. It, it's very selective what, what we're told about. So we're only told really about the first two, obviously Cain and Abel. And then we talk, talk about Seth because he's the, Abel was the messianic seed line. So when Cain killed Abel, Seth was the, the replacement for Abel. That's why he was mentioned. So there's a possibility that there were, and of course there were many other sons and daughters that Adam and Eve had. It's just that they weren't named. And, and another point is that if you look generally before the flood, they lived a lot longer, mm -hmm. but also they had their children quite old compared to what we do because their, their, their whole lifespan was lengthened. Therefore, you know, it, it follows that they wouldn't have had, you know, that they had children at an older age. So after the flood, the lifespans shrunk. And then therefore, you know, the whole cycle happened quickly, in, in, in which case, you know, people kind of grew up, matured quicker and had children quicker. Um, and uh, 
that that is actually um, a classic survival mechanism for a species when when they're under uh, you know less favorable conditions uh, it's necessary to, to kind of speed up the process of the generations so one reason is that you know things didn't happen in those times at the rate that they happen now because uh, the curse hadn't really fully kicked in and they they lived longer lives and they took longer to have children generally. But I would say my main point is that there may well have been many other sons and daughters, but they're just not mentioned. There isn't room in the Bible, as it were, to mention them all. OK, Derek, you're a mine of information. It never ceases to amaze me. We throw out the most obscure questions we can think of, or at least the viewers do, and still you come up with answers that make sense and reasonable to us. If you just tuned in, this is a Q&A show, and I'm delighted to be talking tonight to the senior pastor of the Oxford Bible Church, uh, Derek Walker. And uh, Derek, uh, some of you may have been watching Bible Study, which was on before the live Q&A show tonight, and quite a number of you have been writing in, like Joyce, who says, I've just been watching Bible Study on Jonah. It's so interesting, I never realised how deep this story is and the real meaning of it. Uh, thank you all, and God bless you for it. And then here's another one. Um, which is, oh, I've lost it now. Where is it? Yeah, here we are. Um, you were talking tonight on the uh, Bible study, along with uh, the, the other two, Derek, on three days and three nights concerning the resurrection. And Paul wonders if you could repeat it. Now, the Bible study lasted a whole hour. Don't want you to spend the next hour. We haven't got that long on it. But just briefly, you can explain to us what uh, Paul is asking. I, I would say um, my own ins insight on that is, first of all, I very much believe that uh, Christ was crucified on the Friday and rose on the Sunday. Um, there's so much evidence that that's what the church always believed. Um, that's how the Gospels read. But there, there is one little challenge to that, which is the, that statement by Jesus that, you know, as with Jonah, the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And so people say, well, three days and three nights is 72 hours. And, um, you know, but actually that's using modern Western way of thinking about time. The Jewish way of thinking about time is inclusive reckoning, where any part of a day, you know, counts as a whole day. And, and so if you apply that, for instance, in the, so you get the same thing in the book of Esther. She tells them to fast for three days and three nights and and then she goes into the king on the third day. So uh, it, they're, not, they're not thinking like us in terms of three days and three nights is 72 hours. But the particular insight that I bring to it is because as I am literal, and I like to take things as literally as possible. And so if you actually kind of, it doesn't say three days and nights, it says three days and three nights. So even when you take part of a day, as being a whole counted as a day and part of a night as counting as a night if you literally add it up you actually get three days and two nights mm -hmm. so you know using a friday crucifixion and 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 this bothered me and and i did you know look at you know try and say lord you know what's what's the it seems like a paradox yeah. uh, and i believe the lord showed me that in fact there was a third night because it was a night on the cross, uh, because at, 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 at midday, when Jesus became the sin offering, the sun turned to darkness. And um, the secular account actually says that the stars were seen in the sky. It literally became a night. And so since that darkness only, since the light only came back after Jesus died, there there is a third night. So God's created a paradox there and then he supernaturally sold it the proof of it is psalm 22 which is jesus prayer from the cross and you'll find a verse early on in psalm 22 after he says my god my god why have you forsaken me he talks about how he cried out to god in the daytime but also how he cried out to god in the night so the time on the cross divides into a day and a night the first three hours was a daytime the last three hours was night. So by Jesus' own words, those mm. three hours were classified as the night. So that's how you get the three days and three nights. So that is my particular um, solution 
to the paradox, if you like. OK. And if you want to know more, then you can go to our website and you'll be able to find the very repeat of tonight's Bible study to listen to it in full detail. <laughs> now, Derek, you're a pastor, and this one very much appeals to your pastor's heart because Vicky is praying for someone and uh, her other friends have stopped praying because she says the person they're praying for, organs are failing, uh, circulation is stopping in legs and feet, uh, palliative care has begun. And, and her cry is, when do I stop praying? Is there a time when I stop praying? And how will I know uh, when to stop? Can you help her? Well, as we say, where there's life, there's hope. So. If it's if it's on your heart to pray for this person, then then do continue. And um, you know, in the end, um, it, these things are very difficult. You know, because some people, you know, will will feel maybe from the Lord. You know, it's time to just release them and let them go. Mm -hmm. You know, and especially if that person is a believer. You know that you know they they're going you know maybe it is their time to to go to the Lord, and that will be far better for them then. And so sometimes, you know, people will will feel from the Lord, okay, I'm just going to release them into God's hands. Um, now, if they're an unbeliever, then I think by all means, continue to pray, as as you know, because while there is life, there is hope that you know at the very least God will. God will reach them and turn their heart. But it, I know it's easy to say this, but so sometimes you just have to be be led by the Lord. Uh, but if you have a burden on your heart to, the, to, to pray, then, then just keep praying. But in the end, just su su surrender it all to God, because we don't know um, all the issues, you know, involved with somebody. And, um, and so we, we do our part. We pray. But, you know, if it's their time, as it were, you know, I do believe God wants to heal generally, but, um, you know, we all have to die sometime. So uh, it, it may be that it's just not possible for you to turn it around through your prayers. Um, and, and it's sometimes just appropriate to commit them into God's hands. So I'm sorry I can't give you a, an absolute answer there, but just as you just endeavor to follow the Lord, and if it's on your heart to pray for them, just, just keep doing that. And God will use your prayers one, one way or the other. Amen. Hopefully, Vicky, that's helpful uh, for you. Now, Derek, we all have these ideas about what happens after death and arrival in heaven. And Gillian has written on behalf of her husband, Derek, uh, on, on behalf of her husband, Paul, sorry. Uh, and she says, good evening, gentlemen. Uh, my husband, Paul, would like to know when he arrives in heaven, Will they announce his coming so his friends and family will know that he has arrived? An interesting question, says Jill. Yes, um, I, I think um, I think so. I think heaven is an intelligent place, and I think I believe, because uh, we don't have many specific scriptures on this, but for instance, Hebrews 12 does talk about the heroes, the Old Testament heroes of faith. It's as if they're in the grandstand cheering us on in our spiritual life. Um, that's Hebrews 12, 1, since we have such a great um, crowd of witnesses. So heaven does have an own awareness, I think, and, and when we come, it makes all kinds of sense that we will be uh, greeted by those that um, that they would be aware when it when we are coming to join them in heaven, and uh, it talks in Peter to Peter about how, you know living in such a way that we will have an abundant entrance into the kingdom of God, and it kind of conjures up an image of a of a great kind of a joyful arrival, and and so the more that you have served God as it were. The, and the more that you, your prayers and your faithfulness have made a difference in other people's lives, and I'm sure there will be an abundant entrance, a welcome for you. you we won't just slip in unnoticed. Heaven, heaven is full of the knowledge of God. And it reminds me of another scripture, too, called the unjust steward. If you remember that he, 
he realizes he's about to be put out of his job. And that's a picture of uh, a Christian who um, is about to be put out of his stewardship. In other words, he's about to die because we're all stewards of God's resources. And he realizes he hasn't been a very good steward. So he starts giving away a lot more of the master's money than, than he did before. And he was commended for that because the money we have is is the master's money is is we are stewards of that and so as he he began to become more generous the more he realized this life isn't going to last forever and and his motivation in that is that he will then be welcomed into people's homes in eternity because he will have blessed them in in this life so i do believe that there is a connection uh, of that nature Okay, so Paul, no slipping into heaven. I do like that expression, uh, Derek. Thanks so much for describing that. Now, <laughs> this is a, a question um, which says, hi, Gordon and Derek. My question for Derek is this. When it says in the book of Revelation, when Jesus returns with his saints, that every eye will see him, is this because the vast amount of saints and the glory of God would be so great, uh, a vast mass of people that every eye couldn't fail to see the event? Or is it because of camera recording the event and be broadcast throughout the nations? She says, silly question, but what's your thoughts? Sometimes the silly questions are the ones which help us the most. So Derek, over to you. Yes, I, I get the impression it's not because of um, the cameras particularly. I think that for, to try and understand the magnitude of the event, before Jesus returns, all the lights in the universe will be turned out. So the st sun, moon, stars will not shine. It will be total blackness. And then as Jesus returns, his, his glory and in clouds of glory and with all the saints also illuminating but um the main glory will be christ himself and it, his glory alone for that special day will will fill the earth now jesus for um i believe will be flying you know it describes him on his horse mm -hmm. and while he is you know defeating the armies of the antichrist at armageddon he is actually in the air and uh, i i would imagine that um he, you know, in due time, he will probably, you know, circle the earth, perhaps, so that everyone will literally see him. Once he's finished his victory, he will then put his feet down on the Mount of Olives. Um, but but he, no doubt God will arrange it so that every eye will see him. So I can only imagine my my mind constructs the, uh, the situation that he will, um, you know, circle the earth. He will make himself visible to all the nations as part of his triumph in his return bef before he then sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives. Okay. It's always nice to get thanks. And um, this is a, an email that's come in from John and Tara Galway um, Tara in uh, Ireland. Thank you, Derek, for all your teaching over the years. And we met you once and you gave us a gift of one of your books. So I'm sure you enjoyed reading it. So thank you so much to John and Tara. OK, now this, this is one, Derek, you must have taught about many, many times, and I'm sure you've already answered it on a Q&A. It's the whole question of female ministers in church. Um, Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 2.12 that women should not teach men. This and many other scriptures would prohibit women becoming ministers in the church. Of course, <coughs> the church today is full of women in the top posts. Why is this so acceptable to the modern church and what is Derek's interpretation of the scripture on this point? And that's from Duncan in Inverness. Yes, I, I think that um, uh, I, I very much believe in, in women in ministry. Um, I, I believe that the traditionalists have got it a bit wrong um, because their whole argument is, is, is based in Genesis, of course, which in Genesis 2, and, and there we have Adam and Eve, and Adam was created first and so on. Now, that is a, the, the basis for marriage. And I very much believe in male headship in marriage, and, and that's based on Genesis 2. And 
that that does have consequences. It means that there will be a male bias, you know, in other situations. But it is not a basis that every man is the head of every woman. So although it's true that the husband's the head of the wife, every man is not the head of every woman because that you'll just get nonsense then. You know, you'll have no job. No woman could be in any job where she is over a man, for instance, in authority. And, and you, you, you just get nonsense. So you've got to understand that when it talks about man being the head of the woman, it's a mistranslation. Because in the Greek, the original word for man is the same as for husband and woman, wife. So from the context, you've got to decide whether it's talking about men and women generally or the husband and wife specifically. Now, in the Timothy scripture, I would submit that the evidence is clear that it's, although it's translated as a woman, it's not. Uh, for instance, it says, um, we're in 1 Timothy 2, it starts off talking about men and women in the plural. I, verse 8, I desire that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands in like manner also the women adorning themselves. Clearly, it's talking about the men and women generally in the church. But then in verse 11, the key verse, it switches from the plural to the singular. And it's then it says, let a woman learn in silence, really in quietness, with all submission. Now, the, the switch to the singular is telling you that it's not talking about women generally. It's talking about the wife. It's talking about that the wife should be submitted to the husband. And so... Then it goes on and says, I do not permit a woman. I would say a wife to teach. That means to take the position of a teacher. It's in the present continuous or to usurp authority over a man. This is not just any man. This is not saying a woman, because if that was true, then women wouldn't be allowed to be in authority in any situation not just the church, but generally. It, it should be a wife is, shouldn't usurp authority over a husband. Uh, and then the, the logic for the argument goes back to Adam and Eve. Adam was formed first, then Eve. It's talking about marriage, in other words, and not church life directly. Uh, and then it talks about she will be saved in childbearing, verse 15. It's clearly talking about marriage. And, um, and so I would say that... Um, this is not excluding women from the ministry, that this has been a misinterpretation that has been used to, to kind of subjugate women. Having said that, I do think there is a male bias. I think particularly in terms of pastoring, that I'm not saying that women can't pastor, but because pastoring is a parallel, you're kind of like a family. Um, and so the ideal would be a father and a mother. I mean, I like to look at it that way. Pun. My wife, Pastor Hillary, is, is the assistant pastor. I'm the senior pastor. I do believe that that's the ideal, that, that there is the, the, the highest uh, authority should be a man. But Timothy doesn't exclude the other possibility. You know, in the end, I would say whoever's best for the job. But, um, you know, there is a male headship. There will be a bias because God gave man the authority within marriage and that's some so there is an authority in the male nature probably more so than the female nature so that means there will be a bias there probably should be more men pastors than than women but i do not take a, a rigid traditionalist approach if you like on that well, I think you take an interesting approach and I just wish we're five minutes before the end of a program. I think if we'd have dealt with that one five minutes into the program, we'd have had a lot more emails coming in on it because it's one of those <laughs> subjects that are so hard to understand and people have quite uh, fierce views on, on both sides of the, the discussion. So Derek, thank you so much for dealing with that. Now, I, I began by talking about your, your, your book here and how much I was using it, uh, The Imminent Invasion of Israel. Here's someone who takes us back to, to that situation uh, and they simply want to know is Armageddon actually going to happen? Absolutely I mean if, if you take if you believe the Bible mm. then um, the Bible is very clear about this this is the final battle if you like that um, Satan's final attempt to set up a worldwide uh, government under the Antichrist who is who is submitted to him and you know Jesus Christ is coming 
and will take over the the government of the and so this is the final showdown if you like between christ and the antichrist and so absolutely it's um it's in in a number of scriptures particularly in the book of revelation so yes we are we are heading towards armageddon uh it's called that because that's where the 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 armies of the antichrist initially gather at megiddo in the valley of jezreel in north north of israel and then they go through the land and um it's a very dramatic final showdown um that comes to a head with israel's repentance calling on the Lord to save them, and then the Lord comes out of heaven to deliver his people. So uh, it's very much uh, going to happen, absolutely. That's right, and it's a real place, and people who've been to Israel on their coach tours will have passed by and seen it and maybe stopped at that particular point, and the guide has uh, talked to him about mm. it as a real place. Thanks. Now, Alice from Scotland says, uh, do you think maybe we're very isolated British Western view of a tribulation and when we think times are getting really bad? Supposing she said we lived in Syria or Yemen or even North Korea for that matter, maybe we would then feel we were already deep into the tribulation. Enjoy your wonderful wisdom, says Alice from Scotland. Yeah, yeah, I mean, people do get mixed up with this term because, of course, we do have tribulation, not so much in the West, or just a little bit maybe, compared to the other countries that I've mentioned there. Uh, tribulation is part of the Christian age, and there have been times of terrible tribulation in the Christian age and, and going on now. But that is not... that, but. But that is not what the tribulation is with a capital T. Uh, and really the distinctive thing about the tribulation, yes, it will be a time of even worse tribulation than, than what is experienced now on a global scale. But what makes it different and the reason why the rapture will be before it is that it's not just a time of great evil. It's a time of divine judgment. And this is the key issue. It's also called the day of the Lord. It's when Christ himself moves in judgment. And he does that in Revelation 6 when he breaks the seven, the seals. And then the, the seven trumpets are blown. And then the seven bowls of wrath are poured out. So not only is it a time when evil comes to its fullness, but it's a time of divine wrath and judgment. And that's what distinguishes it from all other times of history. It's going to be worse on a, by many times uh, anything that has taken place in the past. And so however bad things can get in, during this time, during history, it's not going to compare. And Jesus himself said, you know, it's the, it's the worst time ever. OK, Derek, if I said to you, you've got one minute to answer the last question. I wonder if you could do it. It's from Joy and she wants to understand what it means when it says in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes about a cord of three strands. Yes, wonderful. The, um, I think it's talking particularly, of course, scientifically, the strongest cord is three. Not that two, of course, is stronger than one because they it's stronger than two individual cords, but three is the most efficient way of wrapping th uh, things together to get maximum strength. And that's a picture of marriage. Two are better than one, but if they they embrace each other, they, they are stronger than two individuals. But if they invite the Lord into the middle of their marriage and the Lord becomes the third cord, and they wrap themselves around the Lord as well as around each other, then they will truly have a mighty 